I thought I might uh, share a couple of personal ghost stories with you. Seems to be the trend right now, especially since uh, Halloween is about a half an hour away as I record this. I've got a couple of stories for you. They are uh, personal. They, uh, they've been a part of my family's uh, history or what you might call folklore that uh, has gone undisputed for many years. Uh, my dad passed away back in 1991 but he validated these stories too at the time. My mother is still around and, and she uh, she will speak almost sadly about uh, about some of these events. Most of them happened around her. But I thought it was about time that I, I talked about them because they are, uh, although spooky, they are near and dear to my family. And I thought I might present them to you in the creepiest way possible. My kind of creepy. When the cat gets creepy. The first story that I want to tell you about, and these aren't long stories, or at least most of them aren't. And I don't have that many. It won't take me that long. Try to put yourself in the position of, uh, you know, a little boy having heard these for the first time and then having remembered them for a long time later on approaching your your mom and asking her was that really true or were you just giving me you know give me the business <clears throat> as a kid you know to scare me but my mother will get deadly serious on these subjects because she's uh, she's such a firm believer that she won't even watch a lot of the you know the ghost shows that are out there for fear of bringing it back on. That's how bad it was. A short preface to these to these stories is that my mother wasn't raised like probably most of the rest of us were. My mother didn't get a chance to grow up in a family household at a very young age. I mean just barely past being a toddler she became a uh, a ward of the Massachusetts state system on the remand of her own mother who was well for lack of a better term out of her goddamn mind and um, was highly abusive and on several occasions nearly nearly killed my mother from abuse including a including a scar on the top of her scalp from a poker iron that she got hit with when she was about four years old and that's no lie she was simply walking away from her mother without even having had an argument she was just a little little girl almost a baby and out of nowhere her mother picked up a poker iron just basically tried to take her out and uh, anyway she failed and my mother survived a doctor stepped in and said you better do something with this girl or you're going to kill her this would have been about 19 46. Anyway, the stories that came, the worst of them came while my mother lived in a state-run facility. Something that they called a, a home for the feeble-minded, although my mother is anything but feeble-minded. So anyway, back to the ghost portion of this story. Like a lot of good ghost stories, they start out sad. And that was my mother's sad story. You know, eventually her life became happy. Or else I wouldn't be here. But going backwards chronologically, um, the most recent ghost story involving my parents was in mid-October of 1963. My parents uh, were dating then. My father, whose name was also Lawrence or Larry, brought my mother along with uh, his his business associate, a man by the name of Guido, and uh, and his girlfriend at the time. 
excuse me. And they tried to find basically a, a makeout spot. There's a place that overlooks a suburb of Boston known to be sort of a sort of a lookout uh, you know lovers lovers leap kind of spot and it's on a it's at the top of a hill at, at the crest of what is almost like a cliff and there are some viewing benches up there and just a little clearing and it's been there so long that the only way to get up to it is this very narrow walking path that goes in between a bunch of brush well anyway it was Guido's idea he told my dad, why don't we take the girls up to that spot and we can make out and whatever, you know, just to, just to get a kick, you know. So as it turned out, um, Guido and his girlfriend were very uh, rambunctious, I suppose, and they went on ahead and went up the path while my father and my mother were walking around, I guess, in the field down below, just strolling around. And, uh, I guess, uh, Guido uh, was, uh, you know, uh, anxious enough not to make it all the way up the path. So when, uh, he and his girlfriend went halfway up the path in the, in the bushes, I guess they sort of found a little clearing halfway up and decided to, you know, get busy right there. Well, my father and mother decided they wanted to stroll up to the the viewing spot the actual the actual uh, viewing uh, point where the benches were and they thought maybe they could get some privacy up there this story came from my dad when i heard it for the first time so he took my mom by the hand and they're strolling up the path and of course they came across guido and his girlfriend and, and my father was like i don't believe you and Guido's like just keep walking keep walking so my father and my mother went up to the top of the path, of the path and came out at the uh, viewing point. And my mother said, oh, no, we can't stop here. And my, my dad's like, why? She says, oh, there's a guy over there. He's like, ah, oh, damn it. Sitting on the bench was a man. And um, he seemed to be drinking a, a beer and reading the newspaper. And my father said to my mother, he he's not even looking. My mother's like, I can't stay up here we gotta go so my father said oh all right so they went back down the path and uh halfway down my mother said to my father oh um you know i put i she when they got up there apparently they uh they had found a bench when my mother had put something down like a scarf or something a purse some item she said to my dad um oh can you run back up there and get it i forgot it so my father turned around and went back up the path. And when he got there, he found my mother's item, whatever it was. And just just for good measure, he looked over at the old man sitting on the bench. And uh, he wasn't there. There was no other egress or entrance to that point. And my father said, oh, don't tell me the old man fell over the side. So he went over there. And he looked around and he couldn't, he looked over and he couldn't find anything down below. He didn't see anybody. And he, he looked back at the bench where the old man had been sitting. And this is going to sound very cliche, but all he found was a, an old tin beer can buried halfway in the dirt by the leg of the bench. And sticking out from under it was an old rotten piece of newspaper. And my father said he got the chills so badly at that point that he ran down the path, collected my mother, ran past Guido and his girlfriend and said, let's go, we're getting out of here. And when Guido asked him why, my father said he was too embarrassed to tell him why, but he thinks he saw a ghost. I, I like that story. It's short and sweet. My mother, of course, you know, she, she bought a hook, line, and sinker. The reason why she did is because... She has her own stories. I'm going to tell you probably one other story. This is the one that my family passes back and forth the most and has come to mean the most to me because it touches so many points of pain in my mother's life. 
and it went like this she was about maybe 12 years old and still living at this facility you have to picture a giant building with locks on every door and window full of children who for whatever reason weren't quite right whose parents decided to just pawn them off on the system and the cruelties and the abuses and the neglect that went on there were uh, there are many books about it my mother told me this story and I still get chills to this day and that's why I'm sharing it with you because it's too good to just keep <laughs> under our hats at the age of about 12 and it was a rainy cold day but it was springtime it was windy and rainy and the matrons who governed the children at this place decided that it was the weather was too nasty to take the children out and let them play in the courtyard in the play playground but many of the children had looked forward to it and were begging the matrons oh please can't we go out we don't mind if we get a little wet so one of the ladies decided okay um, for those of you who really want to go outside you'll have to wear rain gear and my mother being probably the only child in the entire facility who was normal she got picked on for a lot of extra duties because of it in fact the matrons didn't like my mother because she threatened their positions my mother saw what went on there and she saw the cruelties of these ladies and, and even some of the men the doctors who ran the place and uh, they kept her like a prisoner more than anything else for fear of her talking or going to some authority that could hurt them well on this day one of the matrons saw the perfect opportunity to uh, to take it out on my mother so she said to my mom whose name is Cecilia Cecilia go down into the basement and get the rain gear for all the children who want to go outside get the raincoats boots whatever else you can find and carry it back up here knowing full well that my mother was terrified of the dark because of all the beatings she'd had when she was little and many of them came as surprises in the dark my mom feared the dark well this lady said go down and get the rain gear the rain gear was in a cabinet in the basement floor of one of the buildings and it was at the end of a long hallway and in order to get down there there was an old stairway old wooden stairway my mother said that that creaked and rocked when you walked on the stairs and it was very creepy and she said there was only one little light in that hallway that was dim <clears throat> and made it very hard to see and the place was full of spiders and cockroaches and she said every other vermin you can imagine and she said can someone come with me and they said no Cecilia you're the only one who we trust going down the stairs she's like well won't one of you come with me and they laughed at her and one lady basically pushed her and said get down there so when my mother was halfway down the stairs what the lady did next was beyond cruel she slammed the door behind her and she locked it and uh, thankfully the switch for the light was down in the stairwell a stairwell where my mother was so she didn't shut the light off on her but my mother could barely see and she pounded on the door and said let me out and the lady on the other side yelled you can come out when you go get all the stuff because she knew she'd have to walk all the way down to that cabinet so my mother said that she crept down the stairs very cautiously scared to death because the place she said was nothing but shadows the walls were almost not reflective she said it was so dark down there and she made it eventually to the cabinet and she knew that her only way out was to get a big armload of rubber coats and all that other good stuff that was down there old rotten just basically to keep the rain off the kids she knew the only way to get out was to carry a bunch of that with her and go back up the stairs and she said that as she approached the cabinet she suddenly realized that she wasn't alone 
she said that she looked past the cabinet and to the left. There was sort of a side room, probably a boiler room, she thought, down there. And there was a man. She said that he was leaning with his shoulder on the door frame, wearing what she calls a union suit, which I guess is like, you know, I guess like overalls or whatever it was that they wore in those days, the maintenance crew. She thought it would be one of the maintenance men. And she was suddenly relieved not to be alone. But the guy stood in the background watching her. And she said, oh, I'm so glad you're down here. I'm so scared. I thought I was all alone. And the man didn't answer her. And so she kept walking in his direction saying, sir, is there some other way out of here? Is there another door out of here so I can leave? I don't want to be down here. And the guy just sat there and watched her. And she told me that as she got closer to him, the less she was able to see him. Until finally, when she was standing just about in front of those cabinet doors, he was nothing more than a shadow, she said. He re she realized he wasn't there. He hadn't been there. But for all the world, it was a man in a union suit. Now she's terrified, and she thought, my mind's playing tricks, tricks with me. I want to get out of here as quickly as possible. So she turned to the cabinet to open it. And this is where the chills hit me. She said that as she turned to the door to open it to get the rain gear, she saw two ghostly hands come around from either side of the cabinet floating in the air. She said they looked like smoke and she said that they looked They looked like a magician making magical, you know, motions in the air with his hands, you know, like he's going to do a magic trick. And she was so terrified that she turned and she ran. And as she ran, she realized that the stairway was almost in total darkness because the light was so far away from it and she couldn't see it clearly. And she ended up running into the bottom step. And she hit her toe and she stubbed it. And she was in pain. And she, out of reflex, sat down on the bottom step and rocked back and forth, trying to recover herself enough to go back up the stairs. And as she sat there, crying and screaming, waiting for the pain to subside enough so that she could go back up the stairs, one of those ghostly hands caught up with her and reached for the hem of her skirt. She said that her blood ran cold at that moment and she knew she wasn't imagining it. She could see it with her own two eyes. And she ran, pain or not, straight up those stairs, stumbling, tripping. And when she got to the top of the stairs and expected to find a locked door, she was amazed to find that the door was not locked. And my mom broke through. And she ran straight to her own room. I'm moving the camera. And she ran all the way to her room. And the matron who had locked her down there did not come for her like she expected that she would. No one said a word to her about not getting the rain gear. She doesn't know why they left her alone, but no one ever asked her about it. And she didn't tell anyone about it until she met my dad years later. That's one of the most terrifying stories I've ever heard, and my mother has trouble getting through it now if you ask her to tell it again. Yet every Halloween or Every time there's a family gathering, somebody says to my mother, Ooh, tell us a story about when you were in the school and they locked you down in the cellar. And my mother's like, Oh, God, you're going to make me go through that again. But I believe that she believed it. So there's two little ghost stories for you from my parents. And uh, maybe they'll give you a little chill this Halloween.
as they've given us for the last 50 years. So on that, I'm just going to wish everybody a happy Halloween. Stay safe if you go trick-or-treating with your children. And uh, I'll talk to you soon.